so I'm going to just give a few housekeeping rules for my webinars to start with here, folks. Um, if you're on a Windows-based machine, please mute your microphone if you're not talking. This prevents background noise and echo from happening within the session. I have set it up to allow two speakers or microphones to be open at a time. So if you haven't muted your microphone, please do so now. Please feel free to raise your hand um, by using the raised hand icon. And I'm going to just drag this over here so I can point out to where it is for you. So it's right in here. Whoops, right in here. You can raise your hand. And as soon as I see your hand raised and I acknowledge you, I will give you talking capabilities so that you can ask your questions. Um, please feel free, again, to raise your hand during any time during the session. There will be a question and answer session after the end of the PowerPoint presentation as well. Uh, you should know I hate teaching by PowerPoint, but for the series of JavaScript webinars that I'm planning, I will be creating one for each. And I will be recording these so that you can come back and look at them later. Um, I will stop and ask if you have any questions after each major point of the presentation. So are there any questions at this point? Thanks. Okay, so what are we going to have in this in this webinar in this video? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about JavaScript history. We're going to talk about how browsers work, how JavaScript is processed. We'll look at some very beginnings that you need to think about when you're creating code. I'll write some really quick example code and talk to you about placing code. I will talk about what you should know after you've been a part of this webinar and give you some learning resources, some tutorial re links, and some next steps, things that you can do to continue your learning in JavaScript. So let's talk a little bit about JavaScript history and what it is all about. So <clears throat> JavaScript is actually written in 10 days back in May 1995, the very first version, by Brandon Ike, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, while he was working at Netscape. Some of you may remember Netscape Navigator, and his purpose in writing JavaScript was to enhance the capabilities of Netscape Navigator, make it more interactive with web users. The initial development name is um, was Mocha. Hi, Margo. And it was between May and September, the source code of Mocha was enhanced. Mark Adenreason came onto the development team, and the name at that point was changed to LiveScript. The name LiveScript was trademarked through Sun, now Sun Microsystems. Between 1996 and 97, the LiveScript was renamed JavaScript. So please don't confuse JavaScript with Java, although they both have their beginning syntax based in C++. They are totally different programming languages. One is a scripting language, one is a programming language. JavaScript was presented to the European Computer Manufacturers Association, which I will refer to as ECMA from this point, and in the hopes that the language standards, uh, language standards could be established for JavaScript. At the end of 1997, ECMA 262 Edition 1 was released as the first standard of ECMA Script 1. And what we call JavaScript is really ECMA script for the most part. I don't know of a single web programmer that calls their script ECMA script. And to all of us, it's just JavaScript. So in 1998 and 99, ECMA script 2 and ECMA script 3, respectively, were released. Um, JS2 and ES4 as we know it, are the basics of what we use today. They're kind of the, the building blocks, the cornerstone of JavaScript. <clears throat> At that point, about 1999, Microsoft started participating in the discussions about JScript and the standards. They were developing their own version of JavaScript called JScript. Later on, it was realized that Microsoft was not going to be playing nicely in this little um, piece of standardization, and so they kind of moved away. So 
In 2001, JSON, or JavaScript Object Notation, was born. Uh, JSON is generally considered a subset of JavaScript and ECMA script because it extends those languages and allows for some character strings and some additional um, input that is not allowed in JavaScript and ECMA script. So the next major happening really from 2001 to 2005 was not, didn't take place until 2005. Um, I joined ECMA itself and started working on what we now know as ActionScript. ActionScript is most often used for flash programming, but JavaScript is the base for ActionScript. ActionScript has, of course, moved way beyond what JavaScript does as far as animation and that type of thing. So also in 2005, asynchronous JavaScript in XML, or simply AJAX, was born, and showing that JavaScript could do more than just client-side scripting. It was a huge step in JavaScript's growth. It opened up all sorts of information, and this really came along to do a lot of slew of application programming in interfaces, APIs, and the JavaScript framework. These started out coming out so fast it was difficult for any web developer to keep up with them. And so it became a mishmash. Which ones should you use? Which ones shouldn't you use? So those libraries have kind of narrowed themselves down. Right at the moment, the most popular ones are jQuery, Prototype, JoJo, and MooTools. And to be real honest, these are being released more and more every year, so keep your eyes open for the latest and greatest. Um, keep looking for them. They're out there. The next standard for JavaScript came out in 2007. It was called ECMA Script 3.1, and it just kind of built. It really didn't do anything huge and different. <coughs> but there were some changes made to it between 2007 and 2008, and it was renamed ECMA Script 5. And that's really where we are now. Um, <coughs> a lot of students have asked me in the past, what happened to ECMA Script for, well, it was such a horrible beginning, they just kind of scrapped it and said, no, I'm not going to do it. So what's up next with JavaScript? JavaScript is changing, broadening, again, the um, APIs and the framework libraries are coming out really, really fast. The um, things that you're going to be seeing in the next few years are just going to be amazing, so keep your eyes open for that. So do we have any questions? Hi, Lasani, and hi again, Margo. If you guys have any questions, um, just raise your hand, and I will give you talking capabilities. Okay, so I have questions. I'll go ahead and go on to the next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about how JavaScript is processed within a browser. So Browsers have a built-in JavaScript interpreter. And here's a good point that I can stop and talk a little bit about the difference between Java and JavaScript. JavaScript is exactly what it says. It's a scripting language. It's intended to be used for small programs, small tools, small um, things. It's not considered to be a huge programming language. JavaScript is interpreted, while Java is a full-blown programming language that is compiled. It's used to create programs for a lot of different things. Um, websites, yes, but it can be used for firmware on microwave ovens. It controls probably half the chips in your car. Um, about anything that needs major programming, you can do in JavaScript. Let's see, where do I want to go from that point? Well, let's talk about the difference between interpreted and compiled, and then I'll come back to how it's processed. Um, think of it this way. If you were going to France and you didn't speak French at all, you might hire an interpreter to aid you during your trip. So if you were working with an interpreter and you're in France, you would say something, the interpreter would listen, um, give the French version to the person you were talking to right away. The French person would come back, say something, the interpreter would give it to you in English, and you'd go back and forth in a conversation like that. So it's right then, right now, changing type of processing. So it's interpreted. On the other hand, compiled is more formally like if you were at home, 
being at home and you're writing an email to the friend in France that you made and you sent the email off to your interpreter, who I'm now going to call a compiler, your compiler, and they would take your email and convert it to French. And that now becomes something formal. It can't be changed once he sends it off to your friend in France. Your friend in France would send an email back, it would be compiled and sent off to you. So the difference between interpreted languages and compiled languages is one the kind of a hard copy that can't be changed without being recompiled, it needs to be changed. Interpretation goes quickly, right now. It's really fast. So, um, so what happens is the built-in interpreter in a browser looks for any script elements when the page loads. The interpreter initially runs through the code, looking for syntax, making sure that it works correctly, everything ended correctly, all of that. If there's an error in the syntax, your script is going to probably stop. It probably won't fry your whole page, but it will stop running. If it's OK and the script is called, it will execute as it's needed, as it's required. It will execute code in response to events. So one of the things you need to be aware of as you're writing JavaScript, JavaScript can be blocked by users through their options menus. Uh, some browsers, like Internet Explorer, ask for block content to be allowed, and that block content can be J JavaScript. So if you happen to have something happen, one of the things I tell you all the time in all my videos and everything is test your scripts. But one of the things you might want to also test is test turning off JavaScript. What's going to happen to your page if your JavaScript is not running? Questions? Okay, no questions. I'll go ahead and continue. And very beginning, I want to talk to you about your experience and what you might have with JavaScript if you're just now coming into this. I think, Vasani, you're a little bit into JavaScript at this point. I don't remember exactly where you are, Margo, I'm sorry, but I think you're coming up on it here pretty quick. But the basics of what you can expect your experience with JavaScript to be. So some people claim JavaScript has a really low learning curve, and I find that to be true if you've had some kind of programming experience in the past. For individuals that have never written a line of code, and a lot of my students come in and expect to just snap through JavaScript because they've been told it's easy to learn, it's, it's going to have some learning experiences. You're going to have some problems and issues. And with everything, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, right? Um, don't be afraid of making mistakes. I write buggy code. I'll say that right off the bat. I always write buggy code. I don't know of anyone that doesn't write buggy code at the first pass. There are times when um, I'm out on the web Googling a topic to find out why something I've written is not working or how to make it work. So, you know, there are even experienced programmers. They have issues. Um, I have a favorite. Ref I have my favorite reference spots on the web. I don't remember every syntax of every statement in JavaScript or any programming language, but I usually can find it through one of my reference places, and I can work through it. So keep working through it. See, yeah, this that's it, Lasnani. Your first programming class is going to be a challenge, but believe me, um, Tessa and I are here to help you. We're going to be here to support you through it. And if your code doesn't work, don't get frustrated. Ask for help. And I even put up one of my favorite cartoons from the web here so that you can understand. Um, my code doesn't work, and I don't know why. And I'm banging my head on the desk. <gasps> All right, my code works, and I don't know why. So I'm banging my head on the desk. <laughs> Keep that in mind, you guys. Even experienced programmers, they they have issues. We we go through those periods of frustration all the time. Lasani, please know that we're here to help you. And if you have issues, uh, send us a homework request or send us an email. We're going to be there to try to help you through it and work you through it, okay?
Okay. So let's go ahead and write some example code. And I'm going to drag my editor over here. I think I can drag my editor over here. There we are. <clears throat> and I've got a simple template start up, start it up. I hope you can see it okay. Standard HTML. And I'm going to start way at the very beginning, you guys. So your text, your script starts out with a script element. And the W3C does require the type text JavaScript as an attribute and a value assigned to that attribute. And it's a really good programming practice is that as soon as you open a tab, go ahead and close it. Now, in the real world, a lot of people will leave out that type or attribute with a value. I have no problem with whatever you do once you leave this program, but this program is teaching you the correct way to do it. So please don't forget them while you're working in the PASIC web developer program, because you're going to lose points if you don't do it. And then in order to keep your browser from having problems with your JavaScript, you're going to start your next very next line with HTML comments. Standard, uh, less than, exclamation mark, dash, dash, and closing it with a dash, dash, greater than symbol. But at this point, the JavaScript um, interpreter may have problems with the ending, com ending the comment. So I'm going to go ahead and put in two sing a slash slash, which is JavaScript single line. Great suggestion, Rusani. Or Steve, just scale to fit works every time. Okay. So I'm going to um, do the very traditional, normal, first programming um, piece that every programming language I've every class I've ever been in starts out with putting out the hello world statement. And we're going to use the document.write method to do that. Let me explain to you a little bit about what the document.write is. Document refers to the current document that's loaded into your web browser. Okay? So whatever URL, whatever page is being displayed within it, that's the document that it's referring to. Dot .write is a method that refers to that page and it says put out on that page whatever is between our two co quotes here or our two parentheses. It can be a literal string like I've put out there, hello world. It could be a variable value. It could be a number, whatever you want to put in between those two parentheses. I have out there the um, literal string. So I'm going to save this and oh, pick a browser somebody. Safari, Chrome, IE, Firefox. Which one do you want me to run it in? Firefox, please. Okay. And I'll bring it over here. And can you see my hello world? It's pretty simple going to tell you that the document right here refers to an object in JavaScript. Objects are like things, pencils, pens type of thing, but they're virtual things obviously, our document window. And documents have properties that we can access, look at, and they have methods associated with them like what you're seeing is right here. Um, Think of properties as adjectives that describe something. A page has a URL. It's a description of that page. A page has forms. So those forms are within that page. So that type of thing, documents have, or objects have properties and methods that you can work with. Think of me methods as verbs. 
There are action things, things that you can do to that object or with that object. So keep in mind, properties are adjectives, descriptions, pieces of it. Um, methods are verbs, things that you can do with them. Okay. Um, so let me think. Anything more I want to say about that? That's quite a bit, a lot of information in just a very short two minute class at you. So I'm going to stop here and ask for more questions again. Nope, I think you guys are good again. And I've counted my 10 like I always do, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here. And talk about some of the other possibilities with JavaScript. JavaScript can be used for some simple animation. It can be used for form verification. It can create dynamic content within your page. JSON, AJAX, those are both kind of server communication with JavaScript. Um, sorry, guys, my husband's laughing at me because I'm used to lecturing in front of a class, and I'm waving my hands and talking like I normally would in a class. <laughs> if I if you hear my rings clicking and things like that, that's what you're hearing. Um, JavaScript is really your first step in making your pages truly interactive with your website user. So keep in mind that's what you are working on in this series of les lessons, getting the interaction working with your, with your user. There are, let's see. I think that's all I want to say about other possibilities. Any questions? Okay, so Lisnani, that C data was not a function. It is a capability of, um, it's used for XHTML to make it XML compliant. If you see any of that in my code, I would look at my doc type, my um, HTML declaration doc type up at the top, and it should show that it is XHTML transitional is the standard I'm writing against. And if you don't, then I have made an error. And I sure would like you to send me the page number about where the error is made. Um, that would mean that it was a fairly old example that I copied from an old class. So in, um, let's go back to the code right at the moment. So what she's talking about is that she, in the old XHTML, you were required to have a slash slash, which would block it from the Java script interpreter, and then C data, which is an XML specific piece of code, and then you would again block it from the JavaScript interpreter. And you would close your C data, which is just character data, data, miscellaneous character data. Um, it's not used in HTML5 because we're not worried about HTML5 meeting XML standards. Does that make sense? A little bit? I'm thinking it probably did. Yes, exactly. So if your doc type declared HTML public um, X H T HTML 4.0 transitional, you would be using the C data. It is very much out there in legacy websites. 
you're going to see C data out there in legacy um, legacy sites all over the place. And, and it's just used for validation. So if your JavaScript is using a source instead of embedded JavaScript, you don't need to have that C data at the beginning of your JavaScript in a separate source file. Cool, I'm glad you understand. Okay. I like I said, I'm really not a big on PowerPoint, but I think it helps direct people. So what should you know basically from this little webinar? Um, basically I wanted to really make sure that you know that this is an introduction, it's just an introduction, it's a quick fly at what you can expect with JavaScript, some quick beginnings and, and in the question and answer we can get into more complex questions, absolutely. But I want you to know what you should be taking away from this little webinar. Um, JavaScript is ECMA script. And keep that in mind. Nobody uses it. But you, academically, I want you to know it. Um, JavaScript is the first step in making your pages interactive, making your users work with your pages so that you can do things with them. And JavaScript is easy to learn. Well, yes and no. It is easy to learn if you have some programming experience. If you have, this is your first programming language, you're going to struggle a little bit. It's like learning a language, you know, learning that French, learning that Spanish. Um, you're learning a whole new syntax on how to talk to somebody. So give yourself some credit for getting into the point where you understand to ask C data. Okay? There are vast resources out there on the web about JavaScript. Um, Google is your friend. So keep that in mind. And JavaScript has matured greatly over the last seven, eight years. We have JavaScript frameworks. We have APIs, all sorts of different things that we can work with with JavaScript beyond using raw code. But I always say you got to be able to crawl. you got to be able to walk before you can run. So you're in the crawling and walking stage. And the next set of um, topics on jQuery, you're going to start running and finding out how how easy it is to really work with it. So you use JavaScript to interact with your web users, to verify information that your web user might have supplied to you. You do do you can do some animation and interaction with CSS3. And if you've done any of the CSS3 um, modules, you might have seen some little clips of JavaScript. As a developer, I think one of the most common uses for JavaScript is dynamic change of content. Putting new things up on your web pages as people are clicking on things or doing things. That's that's one of the biggest things that you do. I always strongly suggest that you test your code in all the major browsers, i.e. Firefox, Opera, Safari. Um, what am I forgetting? Chrome. <laughs> Thank you, dear. <laughs> My husband just told me that one. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. <laughs> yeah, and actually, Chrome is probably the most widely used browser now. I happen to use Firefox myself, but the statistics are showing Chrome has got the majority of the market share now. Okay, so some other learning resources. Of course, your Canvas course. Um, we're updating. I'm updating it weekly, daily, as quick as I can to bring in all sorts of new materials. Your CIW and Certification Partner, Electronic Materials, um, those are really good. Books 24-7, do you all know about Books 24-7 and that's available through the library at the school? It's really a really good extra learning resource. A lot of my videos I refer to additional books that you can go out there and look at, and you can always Google it. So our last part here, a couple of quick links. Um, I didn't get very specific with these links. YouTube, oh my goodness, the amount of resources out there on YouTube on JavaScript are amazing. And Google.com or the search engine of your choice 
I'll, don't be afraid to look things up yourself. So um, that is pretty much, do you have any questions again? And then I just want to say thank you guys for coming.